You recently ran a Kickstarter campaign for Spark Corps. Mm -hmm. What was the crowdfunding experience like? Were there any challenges or surprises, things you didn't expect? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So Kickstarter is a funny world, and crowdfunding in general. Um, the people who back a Kickstarter campaign, most of them, they're not just customers. Like They feel very um, engaged and really part of the development process, which they should because they're coming in really early. Like Before you've actually, they're backing you, not just your product. Um, and that um, that can be either an asset or uh, damaging because if you don't treat it right because um, it means that the people who back your product they have a very high expectation for not just what you're going to deliver but what you're going to share right and they want to learn from the experience too um, and I think that we did a good job of man of being extremely open and transparent about what we did so uh, to give a bit of background the Spark Core is a Wi-Fi development kit. Um, it's, uh, uh, we launched it on Kickstarter last year. We were asking for $10,000. We raised almost $600,000 um, from more than 5,000 backers. And yeah, our experience was very positive because every time something went wrong, we would share it. We, did, we had videos, YouTube videos that we took from our manufacturing line like walking down the line and explaining what went wrong and people loved it because they got to learn from the experience and kind of come along for the ride and we've continued that now that we've shipped our product we continue to be very open and transparent about what we do and I think that's really ingratiated us with our backers now customers um, I also think we learned that Kickstarter backers there are things they like and things they don't um, our product fell in line with like what people on Kickstarter tend to like, um, and but also we discovered that a lot of our backers were like professional engineers. Like we now sell these tools not just for like makers and hobbyists and and sort of pro and artists and designers, which are a lot of our customers, but also to professional engineers. And many of them started as Kickstarter backers and are now using it in the workplace for professional reasons. And one of the things you were talking about earlier that came up that you hadn't ex expected was the shipping costs for some of the mm -hmm. rewards. And so talk a little bit about that for people who might be considering a Kickstarter campaign. What kind of advice would yeah. you give them, things to consider? So when you're thinking about how much it's going to cost to make your product, you have to consider everything, right? It's not just about like, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell a product for... $20 and it costs me 10 to make and therefore I, yeah, I'm zero. It's like, well, how many engineers do you have to hire and how long do you have to hire them for? And what fixed costs are there? Do you have to pay some number of thousands of dollars for certifications or for tooling for injection molded plastic? Shipping ends up killing a lot of people because, um, especially if you're manufacturing overseas, it's hard to estimate. Bef you ha like, in order to figure out how much it's going to cost to ship something from China to the U.S., you have to know how much it weighs. Well, how do you know how much it weighs if you haven't built it yet, right? So, like, it can be tricky to guess at that stuff, but you kind of have to get a good estimate for everything so you don't end up sinking under some of your costs. There are a lot of Kickstarter campaigns, I think, that just forget to include shipping in their estimates and end up basically making, selling their products at a loss because they didn't fully, they didn't big everything in. Right. Now, having gone through this experience, and you mm -hmm. also went through a startup incubator, mm -hmm. Um, what role do you see crowdfunding playing in the hardware software development space? And will it become a significant component in that area? I think so. What's, what I think is interesting is right now you're seeing a lot of really interesting innovative products coming from, um, coming from startups. And I think up until just a couple of years ago that wasn't really possible because investors, your typical VC investors, weren't necessarily all that excited about hardware for good reason because it's capital intensive, right? So if you've got a choice, if you're faced with two investments and one is, you know, two guys in a garage who are going to build a mobile app and it's going to blow up and be the next Facebook or, you know, 15 people in a manufacturing supply chain, right? Like that's scary because it costs so much money up front before you even know whether it's worth it. Um, what crowdfunding lets you do is sell your product before you make it so that you can test the waters and figure out if what you're doing is valuable before you go spend 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 on manufacturing. And that, I think, opens up the world of hardware startups. It makes it possible for people to go on Kickstarter, find, the, find their market, 
if they succeed, great. If they fail, they can fail fast and, and try again. We actually had a previous Kickstarter campaign that was unsuccessful that we learned from and launched a successful second campaign. Um, and so, and in the end, I think crowdfunding opens up innovation from a new group of people that might not have been able to do this before. What was it that you learned from that first Kickstarter campaign? Um, so our first product uh, before this was called the Spark Socket, and it was a connected lighting product. It was um, a thing that screwed into a light bulb socket, and then your light bulb screws into the other end, and it makes it Wi-Fi connected. Um, I, there are a few things that we learned. One is that it, it's important to move quickly. Um, I started working on the Spark Socket in January 2012, and we launched on Kickstarter in November 2012. So it was 11 months to get to market. And during that time, other products came out that were competitive that made the value proposition a lot less compelling because there were just other, honestly, better products on the market. Um, but um, so moving quickly was important. The Spark Core took us one month from concept to, to market, to campaign. Um, the other thing is, I think, we learned that when you're an entrepreneur, you can kind of do whatever you want. Like, you don't, you're not stuck to anything. You don't have any baggage, right? Um, so you can build whatever you want. And if you can choose to make product decisions that are easier rather than harder, then it helps you get to market and avoid a lot of the really, really tricky stuff. Like, the, the light bulb product, you had injection molded plastic, you had UL certification. These things that cost tens of thousands of dollars in months to develop. And with the Spark Core, it's a it's a circuit board, so there's nothing, right? There's no fixed costs, there's no certification, anything like that. So it was much, much easier to bring the hardware to market. And all the challenges ended up being on the software side. Right. And, well, you went through the hardware uh, um, incubator as well. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like, and how do you see the hard, uh, startup incubators, um, the role in the space that they'll play? Sure. Um, you know, incubators have been around for a little while now, and like I think the most famous ones are Y Combinator and Techstars. And um, I think when you're making a software product, like a mobile app or a web app, one of the hardest things is just being heard. Right? There are so many apps, whatever you're making, there's probably 35 other variations of it right? that are out on the market or coming to market soon. And so it's really hard to be heard through the noise. Um, and so I think what the software startups offer is a way to differentiate yourself and um, and sort of be, be exposed and be visible. Um, in the hardware world, it's a little different because if you make a cool thing, people will write about it. Like there, there are few enough cool gadgets that they get good coverage, and it's it's easier to be heard. Um, but you have a different challenge, which is it's really hard to make it. Right, the, the manufacturing is hard, the supply chain is hard. Um, shipping around the world is hard. And so I think there are a couple incubators that focus on hardware specifically. The one we did is Accelerator, which is based in Shenzhen. There's a couple others, uh, Highway 1, uh, Lemnos Labs, Bolt, um, uh, RGA, which is now part of Techstars. Um, and I think they all offer a good value proposition, which is uh, they're hard, they'll, they'll help you with the hardest problem of a hardware startup, which is actually making it. We really liked Accelerator because it put us in China where we could work directly with manufacturers and really overcome a lot of the hardest bits of making a product. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's great to have incubators that focus on the unique challenges of a hardware startup. And so the most difficult challenge you faced uh, was manufacturing issues? It's just execution, yeah. Like, delivering on your promise. Um, there, It's like filling out customs forms. It's like the thing that's going to get you, right? It's like the... The stuff that's kind of lame and like not, you know, you're not like really excited to do, but that stuff's really hard. Um, and you have to know how to navigate those waters and find the companies that can help you, that provide different services and partners that can sort of get you through because you can't do it by yourself, you know. You can't make a hardware product with two guys in a garage. It's five guys in a garage and your manufacturing partner, your logistics partner, your, you know, your lawyers, your like, it's a lot of people. Right. <laughs> So at Spark, you're pretty much on the front lines of the convergence of software and hardware. Mm -hmm. How important do you think design is in, as those two areas continue to merge? I think it's really important. I think that um, you there's a lot of excitement now around connected devices and the idea of like bringing products online. 
And when it's done right, I think it requires a rethinking of how the product should work in a connected world, right? And a lot of that has to do with designing the interaction, right? Too often, I think products end up being like, I want to be able to control my lights on, uh, over the internet. Great, I have a phone that like, or an app that I can press a button to control my lights. It's like kind of interesting. What's more interesting is if my lights just behaved automatically, right? They just do stuff. And that all comes through user experience, uh, UI development, which sometimes is like behind the scenes. Like it might not be your traditional like I've got an app with a with like views that I'm designing, right? It's more about the overall interaction. But I think that's where it gets really cool is when you can treat hardware like software, you can start to c come up with really compelling interactions that require thoughtful design on both sides. What are some of the really fun, interesting things you've seen people do with Spark? It's it's a pretty wide range. Um, they cover that goes from like extremely useful to extremely quirky. So like, uh, there's a product that uses Spark called Lono, and it's a Wi-Fi connected sprinkler system. And I think the value proposition is super clear, right? Like, my I should be able to control my sprinklers from my you know from my phone. Also, when it's raining outside, my sprinklers shouldn't turn on, right? Like really obvious stuff. And great, super useful. And uh, and then on the other side, we have Chusatron, which is a uh, a video game console that uses a receipt printer to do choose, choose your own adventure stories. So like, you know, you go through a story, it like prints out a story, and then you read it, and then you decide which there's four buttons, and you decide which path you're going to take, and then it prints out the next part of the story. It's so fun and like totally kooky, and you wouldn't. It's like you wouldn't think about that. And through because of Spark, you can download new stories to it over, over the internet, right? So like, okay, cool. That's why it's Wi-Fi connected. And there's so much stuff on our, on our website. We have a project site that, that's full of cool stuff. Like um, uh, there's a woman, Natalie Freed, who created a, a book called The Tide Book. That's a book that explains the tides and how they work. And when you get to the last page, there's um, a page that looks like waves, and they're lit up. And the, whatever the tide is right now, like if it, the tide is high, then they're all lit up. And if the tide is low, then they're only lit up. To, and it's because the, the book has a battery and a Wi-Fi can right. go on a spark core inside. Super, super interesting interaction with a book. Um, and there's like, one of my favorites is a video. It's just a YouTube video, but a guy created a prototype of a, a cat feeder that he controls from Google Glass. <laughs> so he has his like Google Glass on and he goes, and he, has, uh, he goes, feed the cat and then the like the little thing goes nah, 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 and it like the thing dumps over and the cat gets some food and he just like spends five minutes like feeding the cat from Google That's Glass. That's fantastic. It's just awesome. So it's you know it's everything right and the whole point of this is um, you know there's artists there's designers there's students professional engineers it's, it's really for everybody to create cool connected stuff because we're in that phase now where it's like we're still in the prototyping hobby phase of the Internet of Things. So it's a great time for people to start experimenting. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. For sure. Thanks for having me.